Hi, Steve here, Laughing Stoic. Welcome back to the channel. Sorry about this, it's a significant delay getting this video out, but I've uh, been otherwise occupied. So today we're talking about why is virtue good? Which may seem like a kind of strange question, but I think it's worth just going through the history of virtue and why the people who advocated for virtue systems of uh, sort of psychology and philosophy thought that they were valuable uh, at the times they occurred. So this does reach back all the way uh, to pre-Stoicism. Uh, nonetheless, virtue ethics lies at the heart of Stoicism. And Stoicism is essentially a kind of a defense system uh, for pre preserving and advancing virtue in an individual. So let's kind of start at the beginning. We've gone over the history of virtue previously and I'll try and follow the same sort of tracks. So if we begin in the sort of heroic age, pre-Aristotle, um, many cultures had recognition that virtue uh, was of value uh, and it tended to be, as we talked about, set in the roles uh, of the people who were performing various tasks. So often we talk about having a wise king or a, a brave warrior or a loving mother, although that's not a kind of virtue in stoicism. Nonetheless, it's a virtue and those were seen as uh, critical factors in people performing their roles well. Nonetheless, they were generally seen as character traits. Perhaps things that some people had more than others, and they might be advanced to a degree during the course of their lives, but not that could be kind of extracted, uh, regarded and developed uh, on their own as concepts. So all this changed with Aristotle. Uh, the Nicomachean Ethics uh, proposes a system of virtue in which virtues are characteristics that can be developed in the individual. So Aristotle pulled out the virtues and said you, you can become braver and wiser and more temperate um, and um, etc. <laughs> so from that point of view the question was why did Aristotle see virtue as important and valuable? And so I think it's worth just a little consideration about the circumstances in which Aristotle um, thought and uh, communicated and argued with people. So this was Athenian society during its kind of high classical age. Um, it was a city-state. Uh, it was often at war with other city-states, particularly that anything to do with Persians, which was more of an empire than a city-state as well. Uh, and so Athenian, and it was a relatively small population, I'm thinking perhaps around about 150,000, maybe 200,000 people in Athens, many of whom were slaves, and it was a slave-based economy. Um, so, uh, the citizens of Athens, which who would include Aristotle, uh, were actually quite a modest, modest sized group, several thousand. Uh, and if we just talk about the men for a while, um, they wouldn't be involved in sort of multiple aspects of civic life. They might be trading, they might be involved sort of um, civic politics, uh, bureaucracies. Uh, most um, men of fighting age were involved in the army and fought as hoplites, so that was thought to be a, a task of a noble. Uh, gentlemen, you might say, from the Middle Ages, a bit like being a knight in medieval France or Europe, anywhere in Europe. So this was a group of people who exercise, often exercised more than one uh, areas of skill and contributions to the community. Uh, people, people were seen as uh, capable in many areas, but some people would be particularly capable in some. So it was a rich debate uh, of relative equals. and. Aristotle thought that virtue ethics could only be applied to this group they call the polis, uh, as kind of as described, and that he didn't really think virtue ethics applied to slaves uh, or people who didn't have some education and some economic advantage to allow them to more freedom of choice in their actions, uh, which may be right, but I think it deserves some questioning of itself. So from in that setting, Aristotle. Uh, advocated virtue as a way of achieving excellence. This is kind of the same concept as it was in um, the heroic age, that, that, that the virtues were seen as a component of excellence. But Aristotle said you could develop excellence far more effectively and in the perspective of this sort of community and social life, excellence was not seen as solely an individual characteristic but one that reflected the needs of the community. Uh, and so it's sort of a dynamic uh, activity, being virtuous. Uh, so he also had a metaphysical uh, set of ideas about um, 
everything having kind of a direction of travel, uh, especially living things that they're going to grow in a certain way to do a certain thing, show certain flowers, if you're about plants, or grow to adult animals and then have babies. Kind of a pre genetic idea of sort of similar but broader concept. So he thought that virtue added into this that it allowed you to better express what he called your telos, uh, your kind of nature and your kind of to, uh, best self that could be for yourself and who you were in that society. So the telos was not kind of cast, carved in stone, but for a particular person in a particular community, it would emerge in a certain way, which probably might, might be seen better in retrospect. So for Aristotle, virtue had, uh, had values of community because people performed excellently, uh, had value for the individual because pursuing your telos created you daimonia, you felt fulfilled or happy, uh, and um, it formed part of a developmental arc, character, character development. So it was seen as important in the person achieving uh, what they could in their lives. This was um, followed on by the Stoics, who we've, there's a number of videos describing the Stoic philosophical and sort of psychological system that they used. They slightly altered the virtue ethic uh, process from Aristotle in that they, they held back from the idea of the telos. So Stoic uh, philosophers essentially said that yes, it was important for your character development and to achieve excellence and to achieve eudaimonia uh, to be virtuous, but they didn't uh, inherently teach the idea of telos that it would uh, achieve a sort of not predetermined, but a goal that would evolve, evolve out of that person's participation in life and the community. Rather, they said that exercising the virtues was sufficient of itself to give you eudaimonia, and that's kind of why it's good. But they also preserved the Aristotelian idea that excellence in a community setting uh, was important and valuable to the individual and the community. So then, of course, uh, the Romans picked up Stoicism. Now, I don't think the Romans really advanced these ideas particularly, and so I won't really refer to anything during that age. Uh, and jump forward to uh, Thomas Aquinas, uh, a Catholic uh, theologian, 1400 and something, I think, who picked up Greek virtue ethics and incorporated it into a theology, uh, a Christian theology. So he had kind of a different take on things. We talked about him a little bit before. He saw virtue uh, kind of like Aristotle did, having a telos that there was a particular goal in, uh, for human exercise of virtue. In this, it was, uh, you might say, to reflect the divine, uh, to achieve grace, or uh, to achieve the grace of God, uh, to achieve a Christian um, purpose. Uh, and that all souls uh, were given this purpose, uh, and that virtue was one of the main ways of uh, getting there. So they called the virtues very similar things. Uh, you'll recall they used fortitude instead of courage, but they had uh, temperance, uh, wisdom and justice as uh, cardinal virtues. And they still sit within Catholic theology and you can pick up the catechism of the Catholic Church and find them fairly easily. <laughs> so you'll recall Thomas Aquinas also kind of changed the virtues from the Greek idea of being Kind of a middle row between, you know, like courage and the middle row between sort of cowardice and foolhardiness, uh, to either the virtue or sin, uh, which of course uh, really tweaked the whole system up a lot uh, and made it a question of choice. You either choose the virtue or you choose the sin. Uh, so that's part of the Christian theology as well. So it does alter quite a bit the, the, the Greek nature of virtue as character development. Uh, and sort of um, puts you in peril of uh, eternal damnation, I guess. So then we come to more modern uh, virtue ethicists, and I'll, I'll really just focus on one, uh, Alistair McIntyre, and I'd really recommend you read his book, After Virtue, and if you can't kind of uh, sum yourself up to read his book, read one, of the, read a guide to his, his book, because there's a very interesting approach to the question of virtue a lot of it uh, discussing, as I did in summary, the history of virtue, where it's come, where it's gone to. But he uh, advocates another uh, kind of 
value for virtue, talking about it's good. And he talks about uh, practices. So he says that human beings develop and grow, become adults, um, and then they engage in what he calls practices. These are activities in the community uh, which are complex and somewhat difficult, perhaps a, perhaps a, tra you know, a trade or a profession. Let's take engineering as, as an example. Uh, you have to do a lot of training, it's sort of a lot of hard work to figure out how to do engineering properly. Uh, it's valued by the community if you do it well, then uh, the community benefits and he, McIntyre would say you benefit uh, because you're achieving your best, you're achieving excellence within yourself. Uh, and this is through the application of virtue, you have to be wise and temperate and study hard and, and be courageous as well at times in your professional career. Uh, so the, there's a mutual benefit for the individual and the community uh, and that's where he says the value of virtue lies, that these, uh, developing these character traits is, is a key uh, to human excellence which really flows right back through all the philosophies. So achieving human excellence uh, has always been the sort of core thing uh, in virtue ethics and then reflected in various ways by various uh, philosophies or theologies. So, and the other thing to say is kind of in the modern world, apart from that who's kind of only influencing a, a modest sized group of people, people have really gone back to the idea that virtue was kind of a character trait. So some people are courageous, and some people are loving. It's kind of about them, it's not really about a developed skill uh, or sort of some sort of dedication to a purpose. Uh, and I think that's, uh, something would be good to change really, it would be good for people to see uh, that virtue was valuable to themselves and the community and something that could be exercised and developed during the course of your life uh, and that it would contribute significantly uh, to your life and to the community you live in. So that's it for uh, why is virtue good? Next video I hope to talk a little bit about a sort of a neurobiological kind of evolutionary ideas about where virtue might fit in, which is perhaps somewhat speculative, uh, but should be interesting. So uh, stay tuned. Don't remember to like and subscribe. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. Uh, and we'll see you all again soon. Thanks.